Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us here at the Mechanics Institute. I'm Laura Shepard, Director of Events. We're very pleased to host this program with Thomas Brusig, author of The Short End of the Sun Alley, with translator Jonathan Franzen, author of Crossroads. We are very proud to present this program along with the Goethe Institute of San Francisco and the German Consulate of San Francisco. So first of all, we'd like to welcome Oliver Schramm, our German Consul General, and also Elena uh, Sims, who is the Deputy Consul. And also we welcome, from the Goethe Institute, Executive Director Noemi John Jury, and the Director of Programs and Public Events, Bettina Wodianko. Our talk today will be followed by a Q&A with you, our audience, and we will have books to sell and also to sign after our program. So first, I'd like to welcome German Consul General, Oliver Schramm. Well, thank you, Laura. Thank you, first of all, um, so much for hosting us tonight. Thank you, Laura. You're wonderful. The venerated, iconic San Francisco landmark institution, the Mechanics Institute, a place as old as the constitution of the great state of California, uh, and that has seen so many, so many important landmarks, twists and turns off and in the Golden City history grown and come about. <laughs> dear Bettina, dear Noemi, our close friends, the wonderful team of the Goethe Institute San Francisco, thank you for being such great partners in promoting friendship and closeness between California, the Pacific Northwest, to be precise, and Germany, in especially the field of arts and literature culture that help us understand our times and help us explain each other our thinking, our emotions so much better than economic and or scientific relations ever could at least on each other to visiting delegations. <laughs> and of course, thank you to the shining stars of tonight's event, world renowned, acclaimed, beloved, and prize winning <coughs> Uber novelist and essayist, <laughs> Evan Bergwatcher, the most of all great friend of Germany and Deutschland Verstier, George and Friends, and see what a bachelor of arts in genetics can be these young talents out there book a class with Goethe and learn something. Thomas Musik, German reunification whisperer, and his own magical, light-hearted, funny and charming way, something of a healing voice when it comes to explain and interpret many views and perceptions about and around the humanity and human core, not only of our German society, but the resilience of human nature. In German society and people often are still dealing with and uh, struggling the debris and the rubble that the torments, the aberrations, and the abysses of the 20th century have left with us. 
failed in the experiment. Nazi terror, Shoah, today's Shoah day. Post war division and 41 years of socialist regime in the east of our country. <clears throat> Dear friends, no need to worry. I will not go further in my full <laughs> attempts to describe what's best described by real experts and will refrain from talking about the literary achievements of these two towering and amazing authors and magicians of the world. Instead, I wanted to simply thank you for your time and for your willingness to present this wonderful piece of art tonight. Thomas Brussig's masterfully translated novel, The Short End of the Sonderle, and for sharing your thoughts and views with our audience tonight. I happened to watch the movie Sonderle two days ago with my three sons, and I could not believe my own feeling following Micha Kupic's or rather Michael Ehrenreich, the film, I don't know what his name is for originally, and his friends Buschel and Mario in their comic adventures and travels, claiming their place in their small world and their own fits of happiness. How could I have forgotten how many things, how many things looked and felt back then? Mind you, I was only a Bessie at the time, visiting members of my family in remote Eberswald in Brandenburg and traveling through the GDR many times in my little Mexico people, anxious not to overspeed, mind you, my people only, I think, had a maximum speed of 60, uh, 60 to 65, and to get stopped, 32 horsepower, yes, to get stopped by the focal of those years. How come I forgot so much of the youth lingo at the time, like a fest or something cool, or that a Nikki wasn't just a name, but rather a t shirt. And Toto Oma wasn't roadkill, but a hearty day and a group was. Not so everyone's way. And how to explain to my young ones the funny clothes and style of the time. Yet, and most of all, they were astonished to see that despite the total lack of so many things normal today, no cell phones. Families waiting for phone connection in their homes for years. And worst of all, and indispensable, no switch, no PS5. <laughs> These youngsters never seem to have fun after all, and a lot of it, obviously, judging from the wild scenes of the big and hilariously disastrous party of the book. Dear friends, that to me is one of the most astonishing magic tricks of great literature transcending time culture, catapulting you into past eras, but also reconnecting you with your own experiences, and thus creating or reigniting deep feelings, opening up sometimes long forgotten chambers in your own soul. And at the same time, gripping you with a compelling story, with the fate of its heroes that is directed or dictated by nothing else than the same, or similar conditions of the fundamentals of human life and existence, love, fear, joy, sadness, and anger. And you can see yourself reflected on it sometimes, relate to it, and find consolation in the fact that one is not alone in feeling, fighting, and fearing things. Whether it's the heartbreaking story of the Lambert family <coughs> in the awarding of the corrections, or the alleged exploits of Klaus Ulst in Helden wie wir, bringing the Berlin Wall down in his own special way. So thank you, Jonathan and Thomas, for conjuring up these precious moments and feelings with your words and so many of your readers. Thank you also for forming this formidable US German team of yours, I'm sure, learning from and teaching each other during your tours through the ever changing. American luncheon. In times when the world sees so much conflict, when climate change is not just a threat hanging over us, but already a visible reality in our countries, when globalism and capitalism seem to have become somewhat ambiguous terms in their meaning, and when social networks don't seem to be such social places after all. It is good to have strong personal ties and connections 
and to build on them like you two do. By the way, did you know that the human brain starts working the, the moment you are born and never stops until you stand up to speak in public? <laughs> so let me just thank you again for having me and listening to me. Never before they called Caesar to the Senate. I better stop. Have a great evening. <laughs>
Thomas Ruzik is the author of seven novels, including Vida Vosch, Vosch? I, need a, I need a correction of the pronunciation. <laughs> uh, and Heroes Like Us. He's worked with Edgar Wright on his epic Heimat. He was born in East Berlin, and he now divides his time between Berlin and Mecklenburg. Jonathan Franzen is the author of six novels, including The Corrections, Freedom, and Crossroads, and five works of nonfiction, most recently, Farther Away and The End of the End of the Earth, all published by Ferrar Strauss Giraud. And he's here from Santa Cruz. So please welcome Thomas Brusick and Jonathan Franzen. Louder. I don't, I'm speaking as loudly as I can. You really want me to eat the mic like that? Yes. yes. Okay. Might have to put the mask back on. Um, Thomas is doing a whirlwind tour uh, for this book. Um, hey, we met up in Chicago and and did uh, events in Milwaukee, and he's done other things in Milwaukee, Chicago, St. Paul, and it's really like, what, two nights here, and you're on to Miami? This morning I was in the, um, in the German school, in the uh, German International School in um, Mountain View. Mountain View. Uh, I would never have guessed that there was such a thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but first of all, just a big thank you for, to the Mechanics Institute um, and to the Council Consulate uh, and the Gerthy Institute for arranging this. Uh, this is a sweet little space. I did not know about it. Uh, with lots of empty chess boards right next door. Um, we are going to do a little conversation of some sort, uh, and then we'll take some questions from the audience if there are any. Um, I thought I might just start by doing a a reading from the book in English, um, just to give you a taste of what it's like. Um, and maybe I'll even stand at the lecture. Like this. <laughs> By the way, Thomas, I had a terrible thought, uh, which was, while listening to the lovely speeches, which was, we didn't do the title right. It should have just been the shorthand. <laughs> um, because nobody can pronounce Zonanale. <laughs> no one can pronounce Zonanale unless they know German. Um, it's like, it's an <laughs> um, And the short end, so it's actually, uh, in the, the, the title in German is Am Kürzeren Ende der Zonanale. So at the shorter end of the Zonanale. And I thought, okay, well, we can do better than that for English. We'll just call it the short end because we can kind of get the short end of the stick, which is literally what the Zonanale, which is the setup for the book. Long Street, 1945, city gets divided. Like 98% of the street is in the West. If you happen to live at that address, you've got TV and great cars and uh, lots of money and buy whatever you want, travel anywhere you want to, and if you're like a couple of house numbers over, you don't. Uh, and this well, is the thing I should start reading because it's. Oh, actually, yes. Um, this is, you're going to read in German? I, I, read, I, I read in German. Okay. And so, um, Just to give a little yeah, taste. This is, um, yeah, yeah. yeah, this is. Um, <laughs> Uh, punishment for all those who decided against uh, German courses. So, <laughs> those who had uh, German courses now have the benefit, or the others telling your children and your grandchildren always attend German courses. So, I, um, <laughs> I, for those of you who speak a little German and would like to try to follow along, um, this is basically I, a this is this the this is an imagined history of how there came to be this little bit of the zone of mm -hmm. It's only 
two or three minutes. I, um, it's, it's short. Um, it, and it's the beginning of the book. I just want to prove that there's really a, a German version. <laughs> <laughs> Es gibt im Leben zahllose Gelegenheiten, die eigene Adresse preiszugeben. Und Michael Kuppisch, der in Berlin in der Sonnenallee wohnte, erlebte immer wieder, dass die Sonnenallee friedfertige, ja sogar sentimentale Regungen auszulösen vermochte. Nach Michael Kuppischs Erfahrung wirkt Sonnenallee gerade in unsicheren Momenten und sogar in gespannten Situationen. Selbst feindselige Sachsen wurden fast immer freundlich, wenn sie erfuhren, dass sie es hier mit einem Berliner zu tun hatten, der in der Sonnenallee wohnt. Michael Kuppisch konnte sich gut vorstellen, dass auch auf der Potsdamer Konferenz im Sommer 1945, als Josef Stalin, Harry S. Truman und Winston Churchill die ehemalige Reichshauptstadt in den Sektoren aufteilten, die Erwähnung der Sonnenallee etwas bewirkte, vor allem bei Stalin. Die Straße mit dem so schönen Namen Sonnenallee wollte Stalin nicht den Amerikanern überlassen, zumindest nicht ganz. So hat er bei Harry S. Truman einen Anspruch auf die Sonnenallee erhoben, den der natürlich abwies. Doch Stalin ließ nicht locker und schnell drohte es handgreiflich zu werden. Als sich Stalins und Trumans Nasenspitzen fast berührten, drängte sich der britische Premier zwischen die beiden, brachte sie auseinander und trat selbst vor die Berlin-Karte. Er sah auf den ersten Blick, dass die Sonnenallee über vier Kilometer lang ist. Churchill stand traditionell auf Seiten der Amerikaner und jeder im Raum hielt es für ausgeschlossen, dass er Stalin die Sonnenallee zusprechen würde. Und wie man Churchill kannte, würde er an seiner Zigarre ziehen, einen Moment nachdenken, dann den Rauch ausblasen, den Kopf schütteln und zum nächsten Verhandlungspunkt übergehen. Doch als Churchill an seinem Stunden zog, bemerkte er zu seinem Missvergnügen, dass er schon wieder kalt war. Stalin war so zuvorkommen, ihm Feuer zu geben, und während Churchill seinen ersten Zug auskostete, überlegte er, wie sich Stalins Geste adäquat erwidern ließe. Als Churchill den Rauch wieder ausblies, gab er Stalin einen Zipfel von 60 Metern Sonnenallee und wechselte das Thema. So muss es gewesen sein, dachte ich, ja, komisch. Wie sonst konnte eine so lange Straße so kurz vor dem Ende noch geteilt worden sein? Und manchmal dachte er auch, wenn der blöde Churchill auf seine Zigarre aufgepasst hätte, würden wir heute im Westen leben. Sounds like some people were the audience are uh, uh, did go to church. Yeah. Uh, actually, maybe before I do my reading, I just want to pursue this a little bit. So that's, I think, You keep saying this is written in bad German. That the, 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 in fact, you claim it's deliberately bad German. Um, but a paragraph like that is not bad German. It's actually, so what, can you explain a little bit what you mean? This was a good, yeah, we, we okay. didn't act, okay, just to step back one, one more thing. We didn't collaborate very much. Um, I, but, uh, One of the things you said to me when we got in touch about my work on this was, um, just know that this is bad German. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah. could you explain a little bit what you meant yeah. by that? Um, so I, st I started to write the, the book um, after the movie was shot, but then, then I realized that the, first, uh, that the best things, um, or some of the best things are not in the movie. And so my uh, editor told me, so write the book. And, I, um, and now I had the, The challenge, what is the literary essence of the of a story that was uh, that was made for, for a movie? So um, you can just write the whole thing again. So um, or with the missing scenes, you have an idea why is this literature? And the idea why this is literature is um, that I started to remember. Uh, the East Germany in a different way than I have experienced it. When I, uh, when, when I lived in East Germany, it, I knew it how many times I was depressed, I was sad, I felt helpless and, and, and so on. And, uh, and uh, yeah, it was not a, a, a good life. And, and I was so happy when the war was coming on. But after a couple of years, Uh, I, as many uh, other East Germans, 
started to romanticize in a way. So I I told the old stories, but with with laughter and with with uh, with, with um, yeah, leuchten in the eyes, yeah, with uh, with tears in your eyes, but not with tears, no, with with leuchten. Oh, leuchten! Glow with with glowing glowing eyes. Right. Yeah. I, I, I and at the same moment I I knew there's something. There's, I, in the same moment I knew there's something wrong. So um, uh, so I told uh, I had good. Uh, memories about bad times so and now i wanted to um, and i was was interested in this phenom phenomenon because many of uh, many of the east germans um, did the same as i and so i decided i write a book about east germany but not as it was but as it is remembered and um, why did this necessitate bad writing? Yeah, uh, because good, uh, good writing means good writing means that you are precise. And um, and but when I write precisely about East Germany, so it's uh, it, yeah, I, I write about East Germany as it was, but not as it is remembered. And this is the and this was the challenge. And so I, I, I realized the first, the first price that I have to pay for this concept is that I, that I'm not precise, that I write like, like pop songs, yeah, like Schlager texte. So uh, there are many. Um, so and, and you said that um, you said that, um, you don't want to, yeah, um, eher prahlte, eher, um, I uh, überzeugt because uh, um, good German or good English is say and he said he said he said not um, not use other um, I, I asked for permission to um, substitute the word said for more interesting verbs uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I think and I think that it does create a slightly different effect but I think it's yeah. I think it's I, 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 uh, of course, I know that uh, that you have to say said 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 for for all that, uh, and that it is um, like uh, uh, in, in, in a children's book, uh, you uh, you find that uh, someone says um, that they write uh, er prahlte, er, um, and this book is uh, full of uh, uh, yeah, full of uh, things that you should not do as a writer. <laughs> Even if, if, um, if you you said that, that how difficult it was to you to uh, to translate the first sentence. I I believe you because you, uh, you when you read the first sentence you couldn't believe that. If, Book starts with such a bad first sentence. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you know, not bad, but poor. I mean, it's, yeah, it's uh, it's it's uh, in German. I would say it's it's but it is um, it's um, it, it was uh, it was for 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 better reason. Yeah. Denn ich war einfach vor für aus einem höheren Grund oder aus einem wichtigen Grund habe ich zu Wort geklingelt gerufen. For a higher purpose, I used that um, poor language. <laughs> oh, I'm not, not poor. It's, uh, it's not poor. Too, too it's rich, yeah, too ornamented. Yeah. Well, yes, and it's also very loose. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and many things about it. You cannot figure out what the chronology of the book is because it's, doesn't, it, it, it's not worked out. It's just kind of it's 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 more free associative. It's always story. It's story, 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 um, which is why one of the reasons it's such a pleasure to read. There's always something happening, and even when something seems irrelevant, that's because you haven't gotten to the punchline yet. You haven't gotten to the payoff. Um, but it's true. It's I would say maybe loose rather than bad, right? Okay. <laughs> um, I'm going to read a little bit. Also, ich werde noch mal ja. <lacht> 
Thomas senses a friendly audience. <laughs> there are so many understand German because we can hear. Yeah, you no, know, I can hear. I can hear, yes. Uh, who knew? <laughs> Most of them rhymes with poison. So that has, sorry. Um, so just a little bit, uh, there's a, this is a book largely about teenage boys. Um, and uh, most of them go to dance, sign up for dance school because the prettiest girl, and they're, and basically everybody's a type. And of course, one of the types is the prettiest girl at the school. And she's taking dancing lessons and all the boys even though they have no interest in dancing, sign up because for a chance to like dance with her for three minutes. Um, except one, one of the group, uh, which I translated as frizz. So it's he has hair like Jimi Hendrix. You can picture it. It's like whatever early '80s, really skinny dude, white as can be but with the, with the Jimi Hendrix afro. Frizz didn't go to dance school, things like that didn't interest him. Nothing else interested him either except music. And music itself only interested him if it was by the Rolling Stones. While his friends from the grounds were at dance school, he endeavored to get his hands on Exile on Main Street, the 72 Stones double album. Frizz only wanted it for taping, but the quality had to be flawless from an English pressing, no Yugo shit, still less uh, an Indian pressing. And he'd heard of a guy, Frankie, who had every Stones album. By all accounts, if Frankie wasn't doing time for assault again, he was sitting at home and listening to the Stones at full blast. Frizz went to Frankie's and sure enough heard painted black from the courtyard. It wasn't from exile, but almost. Frizz climbed the stairs and stopped outside a door with the stones playing behind it. He rang the bell and knocked, but brown sugar was blasting. Then give me shelter. Have you seen your mother, baby, and honky-tonk woman? And Frankie didn't open the door. Trying not to think about Frankie's criminal profile, Frizz pounded on the door as hard as he could, first with his fists and then resorting to kicking it. At some point, the door was open, or rather ripped open. A huge brute with tattoos and a long criminal record was standing in the doorway, <laughs> staring at him. Frizz bravely inquired about exile. The tattooed brute continued to stare, his lower lip drooping, and Frizz batted his eyelashes winningly. He thereby obtained the address of a hippie who lived in Strasbourg and was now evidently the possessor of exile. Lost a gambling drunk. Frankie croaked while Frizz judiciously retreated. Frizz rode his folding bike to Strasbourg, which is way, way far from Berlin, by the way, to look for the Strasbourg hippie. He lived in a construction trailer. The trailer was parked between a pair of trees with a hammock strung between them, <clears throat> and lying in the hammock was the Strasbourg hippie. He was listening to music and reading a book with the title, The Fan Man. Frizz wouldn't venture into the construction trailer because the entire trailer floor was awash in album covers. To move around in the trailer would be to wade in records, and this was sacrilege to Frizz. Hey man, who are you? said the Strasbourg hippie. Got your address from Frankie, guy with the tattoos? Frizz said. Yeah, man, know him, man. Lives in Berlin, man. Crazy city, man. Got a TV tower in the middle of it. So, man, what brings you to me? Well, you've got exile in Main Street. No, man, wrong way of looking at it. I mean, yeah, I got it from Frankie, but man, you know, I traded it for Zappa and Zeppelin. Not saying it sucks, exile, but things got to keep moving, got to circulate. Like this wonderful book here. I took it from Hallowed Hands, man, Hallowed Hands. So, yeah, man, I got a shitload of records, but you're not going to find exile here. Bruce was at least able to learn whom the hippie had traded records with. It's Bergman, man. You know what I'm saying? Since Bergman lived in Berlin, Frizz got on his folding bike again and pedaled back to Berlin. When the school's gym teacher learned how effortlessly Frizz could bike long distances, he showed up at Frizz's door with a junior coach. It was a comical situation. Two men in tracksuits tried to recruit Frizz for Olympic training. 
<clears throat> it wasn't funny, probably so funny then, the Olympic thing, but oh, you can't, you can't do a comic novel in East Germany without the Olympics coming into it. <laughs> Frizz talked his way out of it. I have absolutely no Olympic ambitions. Honestly, training's not my thing. Pole vaulting is as far as I'll go. Why pole vaulting? The sports club coach asked, surprised. Because it means practicing clearing three meters 45, Frizz said. Neither of the men understood what he was suggesting. <laughs> the wall was three meters and 45 centimeters high. And according to Lenzi, one of the, one of the friends, the GDR prohibited any sport that could be used to flee the country. Thus, <laughs> no one was permitted to sail or to surf on the Baltic. Kites and paragliding were likewise forbidden, lest anyone have ideas of flying to the west from a high rise near the border. Lindsay knew this for a fact. He was well informed about things that nobody else was even aware of, despite how pertinent they were to everyone. Needless to say, Frizz didn't become a pole vaulter. He figured it was only a matter of time before pole vaulting was banned anyway. Frizz was on the trail of exile on Main Street, which, if the Straussburg hippie was be, to be believed, was in the possession of someone named Bergmann. Bergmann was an anxious sort. Among other things, he lived in fear of house searches, and so he kept his records, which he considered dangerous, in unsuspicious sleeves. An Eric Burden LP resided in the sleeve of Box, the well-tempered clavier. <laughs> Bachman Turner Overdrive was camouflaged by the record jacket of a brass band. To conceal exile, he'd gone so far as to purchase two recordings of the Alexandrov Ensemble, because exile was a double album and required two sleeves. His girlfriend was surprised to see a Soviet army choir among the new additions to his record collection. And then Bergman went into the army, where he fell victim to one misfortune after another. First, a smoke grenade exploded on him in the latrine. He lost his leave privileges for that. Then he gave the wrong directions to a tank, causing it to back over a bust of Gagarin and demolish it. Yuri Gagarin. He lost his privileges for that as well. Finally, Bergman managed to forget his bazooka in a pub leaving it standing there like an umbrella. <laughs> For this, he not only lost his leave privileges, but spent 10 days in the brig. His girlfriend at home had already uncorked the wine and was waiting for him, wearing nothing but her slip. She was so sex-starved. But once again, instead of Bergman, a telegram carrier came to the door. Bergman's girlfriend worked herself into such a rage that she finished off the wine and, cursing the army, still wearing her slip, smashed Bergman's two army recordings to smithereens. <laughs> Blinded by tears of fury, she couldn't see what she was actually smashing. Frizz wept, too, when he learned the fate of the only copy of Exile on Main Street to be found far and wide. <laughs> The one thing I was struck by reading that is it's you're, it's gag writing. You know, you know the, gag, the term gag, right? It's like <clears throat> we're, <laughs> it's not enough just to have it be difficult. You could have just told the story of the girlfriend sat on the record or or on lost it or destroyed it in a panic or she could even have gotten he could have hidden it in the sleeve but it's like there it's like you keep setting it up it's like first he does this then he does this then he leaves his bazooka standing in a pub <laughs> like an umbrella it's like of course he didn't this never happened but it's it seems like that's that's the that's the composition method for this whole thing it's and was like 
Were you cracking yourself up as you were? Were you laughing when you were writing this stuff? <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course, you um, you have to um, enjoy your writing when you write because you are also not you are uh, you are also the first reader. So when you don't like what you when you don't enjoy what you are writing, so uh, nobody will enjoy it. Of course, that, um, but, um, no, but um, okay, but. Um, uh, yes. You know, and it's surprising how many writers don't seem to understand. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, um, Sorry, I interrupted you. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I know your books too well, that, <clears throat> so you can't tell me that it's quite new to you. <laughs> no, of course not. Yeah. Um, but still, it's like. <laughs> This must be part of what you meant when you said this is not a realistic novel. Um, yeah. I mean, these are, it's, everything gets like driven two notches past what would yeah. be realistic for comic effect. Now, of course. Uh, so um, when I wrote uh, my, my uh, the novel before he was, he was like us, I, um, um, I, uh, you discovered. I discovered um, a little bit how comic works, and it's um, the um, so um, the, the escalation. Yeah? Um, and okay, when I was uh, at the army, I saw um, a tank that uh, was misleaded, and he uh, rammed the door. Of course, um, a Gagarin um, <laughs> is more fun. Exactly. So, and uh, and uh, uh, one time, we uh, I was uh, going with my troop uh, among a village, and, there, uh, uh, and the pub was open. And I thought, okay, we really now go there and, and not have not a beer, but a uh, cola. Yeah, and someone forget it was uh, forgot his bazooka. Um, it could be possible. Um, <laughs> so when, uh, when you when you write. Uh, when you write such a, a, such a passage, so you remember all this, and then it one comes uh, to the other. Uh, realistic is that there uh, that there were um, soldiers with weapons in pubs. Yeah. So and no, it's it's not it's not impossible. That's um, and yet it's it's such a different vein um, to to just go for the laugh again and again. Um, anyway, that's, uh, I love, that's part of why I wanted to translate the book, was, uh, I do love a funny book, and there are other fictional treatments of the time and the day to air, which are less funny, it's safe to say. That seems to be the special gift, and I think there's something, there's something so forgiving I know you were looking back and forgetting the bad stuff and remembering the good stuff and the funny stuff. Um, but isn't but that's not just a failure of memory. That seems like the path to getting over something, to forgiving something. Yeah, that's um, that's right. So when you um, uh, when you start. To laugh about something, it changes the thing in a way, yeah. And um, but you um, you need time to um, to get this position, and uh, you need time that you uh, that you want to laugh about something. Yeah. Um, well, it's why I I don't trust writers who can't be funny, uh, <laughs> and why I so. Instantly relax when I pick up a book and there's a breath of humor, a breath of irony in it. It tells me this is somebody who's not like experiencing the trauma and still in an ongoing way, and I'm going to have to somehow share in that. It's like I've got a perspective, and the, and the comic perspective is, is so reassuring in that regard because it tells me somebody has processed it. Yes, um, yeah, um, um, you, um, you, you need time for it, and it's, um, uh, it's not uh, that uh, 
that humor needs uh, people who feel well. No, um, um, the, um, the core of a comedy is a tragedy, I think. Or the core of a good comedy is a tragedy, I think. They are very, very closely related. Comedy and tragedy, I think we can agree. Um, and I would, and I would, I would maintain that that has to do with the distance of perspective. Um, that you tragedy, you're really taking the long view. You're looking at this kind of okay, this is the way it's always been and always will be, and it sucks. Um, <clears throat> And I was going somewhere with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Come me out here, Thomas. <laughs> it's, uh, but it's a risky thing to make comedies um, because um, um, sometimes people um, don't. That's fine. Yeah, for, for, yes. yeah, for, uh, don't, don't forgive you uh, making making comedies. It, um, um, so um, I think um, uh, Life of Brian was <laughs> all, uh, almost banned. Um, and uh, and of course, um, Kürzen and Elida Sonne was um, um, oh, it, was, it was not easy to. Um, uh, okay, uh, there was laughter about it, but uh, uh, there were, were many people who said, I want to um, yeah, um, I want to glorify um, East Germany, and uh, no, of, uh, of course I don't want, but um, when uh, when the laughter starts, it's, it's, it's dangerous, it's, it's, it's dangerous. Yes, it's politically dangerous, um, and, and because and it's, I it's politically that, effective. Yeah, and of course, I can I can't expect that everybody uh, can uh, can laugh about these jokes. Right? Um, so everybody has the right to to refuse it. Um, um, that's um, but um, just imagine. North Korea ends. Oh, oh. this comedy. Oh. <laughs> no, yes. I, I, I wish the end of North Korea just for the comedy sequel <laughs> that, that will come. Yeah. You know, the, the figure of Kim Al Jong has enjoyed quite a run as a, as a figure of comedy in American movies here. Um, but of course, it's no joke. He's like trying to get his missiles accurate enough to put a nuclear weapon on. Um, Union Square, it's like not funny, and yet it should be. <laughs> and when it's over, you can make it once exactly once it's over, if it's ever over. Along the way, um, even though this is this is a book of, it, it's a book of. Almost, it's it's not sketch comedy. It's it's gags. It's it's really it's funny stuff, and and people passionately pursuing ridiculous things. Um, the, the really, in, in many ways, the frame of the book, and this is not true of the movie, involves Mika Kubish's pursuit of a letter which he believes to be a love letter, which he starts to open outside his building, which is, of course, right up against the wall. Um, and a gust of wind comes along, blows it out of his hand, over the barbed wire, and into the death strip between East Germany and West Germany, where there are people at towers waiting to shoot you if you go out there, if you could make it over the wall. Um, and he spends the entire book trying to, he can see it. He can see the letter kind of stuck in a shrub on this no man's land um, in this heavily fortified area and and in some ways that's the through line of the story it's partly about his love for the girl he believes may have sent him this letter but it's also just completely absurd that the lengths to which he goes um, <laughs> to try to retrieve the letter 
Um, I'll just give one example, which is a fishing pole with, uh, with glue, a little blob of glue at the end of it. One person watching with a periscope giving directions <laughs> to the person holding the fishing line. I'm not giving too much away because there are other uh, equally crazy attempts to recreate this life. It's in vain. It's, and of course, everything is in vain. It, it, but, but, but that doesn't, everything doesn't, they do is in vain. Everything. No, they, they don't succeed. Oh, you only saw it. Frizz is going to not get his. You know, he's never going to get his exile on Main Street. Um, and so what, 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 one of the things that if you don't, if you're not so familiar with that period, one of the things that's really great is you are following these characters with their ridiculous comic pursuits, vain pursuits. But along the way, you're getting a pretty complete picture of, um, certain aspects of political enforcement, um, privation, uh, and and boringness that was a lot of the daily life in, in East Germany. So almost in spite of itself, this is, I think, um, not a bad introduction it's to, to, to um, some of the basic facts about life in East Germany. Um, <clears throat> yes, and I used to say in, in German, I tried to uh, translate it into English, Man muss es schon selbst erlebt haben, um es nicht zu begreifen. We should turn it over. If there are any audience questions, uh, we have actually have a microphone, <coughs> conveniently a third color, blue. Okay, I'm coming your way. Council Shram, I'm coming your way. Oh. It was just a quick follow-up question. You mentioned that your novel uh, has uh, gotten angry. Some people uh, thinking you made, uh, you made fun, telling gags and jokes, you made fun about the system. Have you also experienced the other side of the spectrum, saying, well, he, uh, in his in his novel, he's cozying up too much. He's, as, as you mentioned in the beginning, he's, he's um, depicting a, a life in East Germany which didn't exist, which was uh, too much fun for worldly experience. Is that, is that also a nostalgy driven novel? Is that something you would experience also when you published when you out? Um, um, yes, of course. Uh, the, um, and it's not uh, wrong to. Uh, to uh, Say this is uh, nostalgic. Yes, it. it um, I am um, literally nostalgic. Nostalgia <laughs> <laughs> was the was the name that was coined uh, yeah, late in the nineties. Yeah. Yeah. and um, uh, that's not wrong. But um, I did it for a higher purpose. And um, I. <laughs> <laughs> um, God damn it. <laughs> you did it for a higher purpose, God damn it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But um, <laughs> I, I was completely, um, completely helpless um, when someone said, yeah, yeah, exactly as uh, it, it, it was that um, this, this is uh, as it was. So, uh, because I said, no, it was not, uh, it's not in Germany as it was, it's in CGI, uh, it's, it's, it's Germany as it was remembered, or as it is remembered. But uh, when someone says, no, exactly this was East Germany, I'm helpless. <laughs> I'd like to ask a question of the of the translator. Is Deutsch the Muttersprache, or where did you learn it? No, I, I don't. I was um, my last name looks German, but it's actually Swedish. Uh, no, no German in my family. Um, my mother claimed to have some great great aunt who came was from Vienna. 
I didn't believe it. Um, <laughs> I just, I think I, I took, had to pick a, pick a language in high school. And, um, and then it was, it became a way in college of pursuing something that seemed potentially practical while studying literature. I tell my parents, you know, international banking, <laughs> <laughs> diplomatic corps. And they would say, oh, okay, he's learning a skill. He's learning a trade. <laughs> when I was just, you know, reading Goethe and Kafka. Question. Yeah, I have two questions for Jonathan. Uh, the first one is why now? Why why did you translate the book right now? It's not brand new. And the other thing is there are two translators mentioned. Is there something like a ghost translator or how did you how did you Those are actually that? the same question. Uh, 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 let me explain. Um, <clears throat> so I read this book many years ago, uh, along with Helen D. Bear and some of the like, uh, because I was reading very purposefully. I did not the like that is long, um, and I would, would have other books I needed to read because I was working on a novel of my own that had a lot of East German stuff in it, and. Uh, a good friend, um, Daniel Kelman, his wife, Anna, uh, said, oh, well, you've got to read Brusig, because uh, <laughs> Zolvar, because <laughs> that's how it was. <laughs> um, she did kind of say that. She said, um, he, 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 because because in the popular representations of that time, it was either this dark, dark, the darkness behind the Iron Curtain, and you just see prison cells and gray streets, or that you have the very, very earnest um, Lives of Others movie, which got a lot of attention. Um, and Lives of Others is not my favorite movie, um, nor Anna's. Uh, Saying it's just like, well, that's just not that's that's a fairy tale. That's not how it was. Here's the people to read, and, and Thomas was at the top of the list. Um, and then uh, then we we spent an evening together. Catch me, he made dinner, um, and uh, I had one particular question for him for the novel I was writing, and he answered that. Anna and I could not come up with it. Thomas came up. We were just looking for the right word. In German, um, and uh, so I knew this book, and I thought, and being lazy, I thought, is there an English translation? Because I read German, but it's like at half speed, um, and it's not the easiest German. Uh, this, because there's a lot of a lot of slang and loose diction. Um, there wasn't. I was surprised. Uh, I was like, how how are some of these other things getting translated in English? And it's something that is such, it's just a beautiful, in its own way, perfect comic novel. Uh, and so I was shocked, but I didn't think anything of it because I was mostly thinking about myself and my own work. Um, so then, what, like three years ago, I hear from this woman, Jenny Watson, who teaches at Marquette, who's frustrated because she loves the novel. She teaches um, modern East German history and literature to, uh, or modern German, I don't know what she teaches, I forget exactly what the course was. At any rate, she was frustrated that she couldn't, non-German speaking students, she couldn't teach this book. She said, like, this is the book I want them to read because they're 19 years old. They will get these characters. Like, Argh! And I said, why don't you try translating it? Um, and she said, I'm not a translator. I said, well, you know, I can help you. Um, and that's how it, that's really how it started. So it was really her energy and, uh, and, and she actually broke, you know, she kind of was the icebreaker cutting through. She did, she, she did a quick, loose <laughs> translation. 
Um, and then, then I kind of went through uh, and went sentence by sentence and did my own translation on top of that. But that's why. And and she and it wouldn't have happened without Jenny, who's just a, actually a really lovely person, um, a suffering, a suffering humanities professor. <laughs> <laughs> Question yeah, back, yeah. Um, and, and I have to add, um, when I saw the first pages that, uh, um, from, from John's translation, I was so happy because I have seen before some uh, translations that hadn't been published. So I knew how a Sonnenallee translation uh, usually looks like. It. But when I saw it, oh, no, okay, it's my Sonnenallee. But when I saw the first pages from, from John, I so, oh, wow, yeah, finally somebody understands me. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was really the, um, so I think my train uh, once said uh, that the difference between the right word and the almost right word is the same as between a flash and a yeah, <laughs> uh, firefly. Yeah, it is uh, between lightning and a firefly, maybe. So, um, and I um, and, and and I saw in that page that he that he always uh, had uh, made the, the right decision because translating is making decision with, with every word you have uh, you, you have to make uh, you have choices and you have to make a decision and he made the right decisions and I'm really unbelievable happy to uh, have such a uh, wonderful translator. It was fun. Ah. Question back here, and then I'll come front. The book, in a sense, uh, takes place in a timeless setting, and it's only with the quasi-epilogue uh, that there is a look back uh, to it. Uh, I have had the good fortune to look at a couple of your other books. I mean. Uh, Howard Blows and uh, Heroes Like Us. And the difference in that sense is market. Yeah, they are dynamic in the sense they take you through time. Uh, how did you move from one to the other? So um, that's, that's right. Uh, this book has a, uh, has a special time concept. Uh, when I said that I want to write about remembering, so um, the decision is that book uh, that place in the past, and there is uh, you can't say it's in the uh, early eighties or in the middle of the seventies or in the late eighties. So it's the past, and um, um, and when you try to um, when you um, when you remember, you know, uh, you know this episode in your life and you know this episode in your life, but you can't bring it in an order. You knew I had an accident, but did I move? Did, did you move? Uh, was, uh, was it a was move or the accident before? Or was the, um, or did I buy the, uh, that, um, my, my last refrigerator? Was it before the accident or after that thing? Yeah, you know there were things like that, but you can't bring it in an order. And when you have all these episodes here in, in the book, you can't bring it in, in an order. It's a, it, um, it's a, yeah, it's a, group, uh, it's, it's a big pot of episodes, and um, they are told um, one after the other. But um, it's the, the time is um, mixed, and it, it's it's a whole mess. Yeah, and but this is uh, it's also a concept. It's not uh, a weakness. Yeah, I know all the weaknesses of the book, but this is uh, this is intended. It's a feature. <laughs> it's a feature. <laughs> feature, not a bug. <laughs> okay. Okay, um, yeah, I would second that. It's uh, that it. <clears throat> it's a little fairy tale like, but it mostly is. It's you. You are immersed in. You're, you really feel immersed in memory, and it feels like, um, and every once in a while, I think two or three spots, this I narrator pops up. 
Um, and I had to ask you in one instance whether that was actually an I did narrator or whether it was ambiguous because it could have been indirect, it could have been Mario speaking in indirect discourse. And you said it was the I narrator, just to kind of like tell you and sometimes and, and 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 we and the first the first person plural shows up several times. We couldn't travel because we didn't have passports, um, things like that. And and so it's 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 subtle, but it's very it's clearly a strategy to to not place this in a historical um, even rationalizable uh, sequence. For um, yeah, for the feel good feeling, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, um, so um, how can you try to try to try to Okay. okay. Actual Germans are failing to translate. <laughs> I'm not going to go too bad. We had another question here. Good evening. Um, I want to reflect on this idea of nostalgia because I think that in, in Western democracies we have um, this kind of terror of nostalgia. Um, it's uh, There's this idea that Oh, it's always dangerous. It's always going to pull us back to the past. It's always going to delude us. And I, I don't know that it is. I think nostalgia can be um, a rich territory for the imagination. And I think if we don't allow people to engage in some forms of nostalgia, that can be a danger as well. Yeah, um, I think uh, there is about that East Hamja, there, is an, um, uh, there is a kind of misunderstanding. Um, so when people in East Germany, when they feel nostalgic, yeah, they, um, so the, the nostalgia uh, is an, um, it's a result of a kind of um, official history telling, yeah, with, um, that uh, uh, anti-human regime and uh, Stasi spy uh, state and, and so on, and uh, uh, and the personal experience. You could have a, um, a quiet life, a quiet, poor life um, when, not, when you were not interested in, in politics. So um, it was not terror for, for everybody. Um, it was uh, terror and horror, uh, and horror for 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 some few, but um, uh, you you know what you had to do not to uh, come into this. But go back to the East Asia. So if people um, feel nostalgic, yeah, they don't want to have back East Germany. They just do something that everybody loves to do. They remember, yeah. And um, when you said I'm a kind of uh, reunification flüsterer, yeah, with reunification flüsterer, uh, whisperer. So um, to explain this uh, phenomenon uh, that uh, um, East Turkey is no danger, it's no uh, no kind of uh, rollback of. Um, yeah, it's, it's no uh, revanchismus, yeah, no, uh, um, revanchism, revanchism, revanchism yeah. um, uh, but it's simply uh, everybody loves to do, but when you remember um, the 70s, you have no um, half official history, um, yeah, Geschichtsschreibung, um, or, or uh, history, um, there is no official narrative that yeah. you are narrative is that, that, right. <coughs> that your nostalgia is in. So that, 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 is con uh, that, you, um, that your memory is uh, getting confronted. So you can, uh, it's much easier to you to remember the past. And nostalgia also often has to do with a certain disappointment later in life. You become nostalgic for 
the time when you were younger. Um, and, and there was a lot of disappointment following the euphoria of reunification. Um, and for a lot of people in the East, there were actually even rational reasons to regret the passing of certain aspects of a state that guaranteed you a place to live, guaranteed you work, guaranteed you health care, guaranteed you education. Um, so that's part of it too, okay? disappointment. Uh, a late, later in life disappointment can lead to nostalgia. Question in the back. Yeah, I, I would like to follow up again on, on the reception of the book, wondering whether um, it was differently received in East, former East Germany and, uh, and West Germany, also with regard to generations. So this is apparent. I have not read the book and I have not seen the movie, but I was wondering whether younger people um, get that just because it has maybe some kind of a, a youth genre and, and the, the way it's the it, things are talked about and, and reflected or um, someone who could not say this is how it was or this is not how it was or this is how we can talk about it or remember it someone who is just too young to have that kind of a relationship to former East Germany and the murder, how it has been received um, yeah um, so um, in general, um, between East and West, there, there was a difference. Um, so the um, in the East, uh, many says uh, many said, uh, "Yeah, yeah, this is uh, how it was." And in the West, um, yeah, many were happy to have a comedy about East Germany. Yeah, so uh, that, um, so that there was a longing for. Uh, for laughter uh, about uh, that time. So, um, but of course, uh, there was a kind of police, um, and this police was uh, mostly in the West that said, no, you can't uh, make jokes about uh, East Germany. This is a kind of uh, glorification, and uh, this is what uh, this is not allowed. And um, some of them learned what, uh, what uh, uh, intention of the book was in some way, but um, it's normal that you are misunderstood as a, as a writer. And with the, um, with the younger and the older, um, I think um, for the younger, I'm, um, I'm an, uh, an old writer who writes about things that happened long before they were born. Yeah? And when I was young, and uh, and those writers uh, came to me with with their stories, I knew um, uh, how hard it was for them. Yeah? I, I know how hard uh, how hard it was for them. So um, the um, the book is um, is read at schools um, many times and. Uh, Teacher, the teachers, uh, of course, tell them this is a book about East Germany and not this is a book about uh, remembering. So um, it's not my fault that uh, they. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, the beginning of the, the first and the last episode of the book are, you, you can see it that um, that's not realism, yeah? that it's a. Uh, uh, that it's uh, pure myth, yeah. And um, but yeah, I can't um, I can't help it when you say it's uh, when the teachers say it's it's poor. I did uh, what, what yeah I, what I could. <laughs> They're just gonna have to look up the doors on the internet. <laughs> Question here. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, two questions to, to, to Jonathan. First of all, what was the, the word that Thomas helped you with? And um, also related to that, um, how would you say did uh, Thomas writing like, inform your understanding about the, the GDR for your own writing? Uh, I, 
Wasn't it Zigeuner Mädchen? Nein. Nein. Ja, ja. <laughs> there is, there is, a, there's a character, Andreas Wolf, and he, he sees himself as a serial seducer of teenage girls. And there's, but he has a kind of funny word for it. We can look that up. Bahnsteig's um, boy to take Yeah. Bahnhof's boy to pick up. Uh, I think I think it's yeah. A yes, a sewer of uh, kind of train platform girls. <laughs> Approximately <laughs> Okay. Sorry. Um, you know, it's just, it was, uh, I, I, I like to write a funny novel, and to be given permission to be funny, um, I think that was the main thing I took, uh, was this, uh, from Thomas, was, you don't have to be tremblingly serious about the terror of the Stasi. I mean, you can also you can acknowledge it, but you can also laugh, and maybe above all, you can just invent. Um, and that was that was not something you said. I think it was something Anna said. Was oh, sorry, wrong person, wrong book. Never mind. <laughs> all right, this will be our last question because we want to have time for you to buy books and have them signed. And meet our guests in person. Last question. Okay, when I asked you earlier why now you gave your personal story, what I'd like to know is why would an American reader under 50 want to read this book that's not even historically correct? <laughs> <laughs> did, you, did, you, did you have the feeling you had to add footnotes? Because it's really, no, there's no, there's not a footnote to be found. There is an introduction in which I sketch out some basic background. And, Really don't give away any of the story to speak of. It's 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 not a spoiler for the intro. Um, the main reason to read it is that it's you do actually learn something in, in spite of the comic and um, philosophical intentions of the author. You do learn something about a time you might not know much about. Uh, but the main reason, as always, is it's, it's really fun. That's the reason to read any piece of fiction, in my view, and certainly this one is really, really fun. And moving, sweet. Thanks so much, everyone.